Good morning. I hope uh, everybody that is to start. First of all, I'd like to welcome all the participants who will be with us today at this uh, webinar on the water concessions under the project uh, strategy and uh, environment strategy and action plan in Bosnia and Herzegovina. I hope, uh, as far as I can see, we already have a lot of participants. Um, more will join. I want to welcome everybody present here in this webinar. Uh, good morning. Uh, we had some technical problems, but I hope you managed to hear me. We will start with the webinar on concessions, water concessions in Bosnia and Herzegovina, which is organized uh, under the environmental strategy and action plan in Bosnia and Herzegovina. I'd like to greet all the participants and all those who will join us at some later point. For those with whom we had no opportunity to meet before, I would like to introduce myself and my colleague who will be the moderator. My name is Selma Cengic from the Institute for Hydrotechnic and Mr. Svetlana Lolic from the University in Banja Luka. Faculty of Natural Science and Mathematics. We are a part of the team that is currently implementing the project of uh, environmental strategy and action plans, and we will say a few words about it later on. Besides uh, two of us, there are also colleagues uh, who are actually financing the project from the Stockholm Environmental Institute as well as our expert who will be the panelists during this webinar and who will share various experiences uh, related to the water concessions in Spain, Sweden and Croatia. These are uh, Mr. Peter Rudberg, Mr. Pedro Brufao and uh, Ms. Alida Ban Pavlovic. I will, uh, I'd like to welcome them as well as our colleagues from Sweden. Since this webinar is uh, a part of the whole uh, environmental strategy and action plan, I will say were a few words about the project as such. The preparations for this project started long time ago in 2018, when the entity governments and the Birchko district government applied to Sweden for assistance in developing this strategy. After this, Embassy of Sweden uh, turned to the Swedish Environmental Institute and asked them to develop a feasibility study and the project preparation document for this strategy. In July 2019, after the uh, documents have been prepared, all the governments at all the levels in Bosnia and Herzegovina adopted this document and uh, thus approved the project. And it officially started in September 2019. And it's uh, expected to close in April 2020. This uh, <coughs> strategy document it will include strategies and action plans for all four jurisdictions in Bosnia Herzegovina. That means the Federation of Bosnia Herzegovina, Republika Srpska, Brčko district and the level of Bosnia Herzegovina. The strategy will 
its implementation will last 32 months, most likely. As for the implementors, uh, the main implementing agency is the Stockholm Institute, the headquarters of the Stockholm Institute in, for Environment in Sweden, and the office of the Stockholm Environmental Institute in Tallinn, and local partners and local leading experts in the area. Partners in this project are the delegation of European Union in Bosnia and Herzegovina and non-governmental organizations. As for financing, the project is financed by the government of Sweden. The strategy itself will be a document that will include strategies and action plans for all four jurisdictions in Bosnia and Herzegovina. And it will include all these segments that are required for environment according to the EU legislation. That means uh, water, waste, biodiversity, air quality, climate change and energy, chemical safety, sustainable resource management, including forests, uh, fish stock and minerals, and environmental management, which is basically the horizontal policy. So this was in brief about the project within which we plan to hold today's seminar. I will ask Ms. colleague Svetlana Lolic to give us a brief overview of the basic information on the status of waters in Bosnia and Herzegovina and uh, legal framework uh, applied to the concessions in Bosnia and Herzegovina, and then we will proceed in accordance with the agenda. Svetlana, thank you. First of all, I'd like to thank you for uh, joining the work of this uh, webinar. There are more than a hundred of us right now, and I would like to thank our panelists who will uh, participate today. My name is Svetlana Lolic, and I'm professor at the uh, Faculty of uh, Natural Sciences and Mathematics. As Salma has said, uh, two of us are consultants for strategy and action plan in the water sector. Now I will share my presentation with you. I hope you can see everything. Selma, can you just confirm that uh, that my presentation is shared? Yes, yes, it is. As Selma has said, in uh, developing this strategy and action plan, we uh, got divided into seven working groups, and we are a member of the water working group. What's the situation with waters in Bosnia and Herzegovina? I am. Uh, a big fan of this old saying that picture speaks thousand words. This is a map of hydromorphological status of rivers in Bosnia Herzegovina. Blue are the best quality waters, green are slightly modified, and the worst class is the are the waters of the fifth class, the red rivers. When we look at this map, we can be relatively satisfied, not completely. Look at how the things look in Montenegro, but our waters are still relatively of good quality. And what we are trying to do now is to keep them that way or improve their status. The point and what is the requirement of the European directive is to achieve the good status. What's the status in other countries? Just to put uh, this in context, how wealthy we are in terms of water resources and how our waters are still of quite good quality. If you look at the hydromorphological status in Germany, I presented it here. In order to keep things as they are, at least, one of the ways 
is to develop this strategy and action plan. This water management aspect is uh, very important. Waters are very susceptible to pressures on both quality and quantity. We have inadequate legal and institutional framework for approximation of the EU legislation. Other problems that we are faced with uh, uh, include unsustainable use of water resources. And in recent times, we are all witnesses to some extreme hydrological events. We had some floods and drought, droughts. And one of the main problems in Bosnia-Herzegovina is, of course, financial issue. The water sector and maintenance of the water sector requires uh, a lot of funds. When we were thinking uh, what will be the topic of our webinar, we decided on the concessions. We decided to focus on concessions. Um, why? Because that is the trickiest question. A question where the working groups will have uh, two uh, uh, most opposing opinions. On one hand, we have to balance the necessary economic development that requires concessions, while on the other hand, the, we have the protection of environment. And uh, in many example, examples, uh, we saw that concessions lead to negative changes to the ecosystem and uh, it harms and undermines the environment and habitats. The water management is uh, falls within competencies of the entities and Brčko district. The laws exist at all four levels. We have the law on concessions of Bosnia and Herzegovina and we have laws on entities of the Republika Srpska and the uh, Federation of Bosnia and Herzegovina and of Brčko district. In addition, in the Federation, there are also cantonal laws on concessions and all these levels, there are secondary regulations. At the level of Bosnia and Herzegovina, I deliberately said for all levels, the concession, what's the definition of concession, because it is not consistent to all laws. They are close, but not identical. The concession is the right that uh, the concedent awards for the purpose of providing uh, construction of infrastructure or services and uh, exploitation of natural resources within the deadlines and other conditions agreed. At the level of Bosnia Herzegovina, there is the Commission for Consent Concessions, which is a joint commission, and it proposes awarding concessions for those uh, goods or assets that uh, are located on the territory of both entities or a republic or a Brčko district. When the asset is not located in only one administrative uh, jurisdiction and the decision is made by the Council of Ministers and has to be ratified by the Parliament of Bosnia and Herzegovina. It's a rather complicated procedure. And the contract on concession is uh, signed for 30 years and under special conditions uh, for 50 years if uh, construction of a facility or a plant requires longer time. At the level of the Federation, there is also the Commission for Concessions of the Federation of Bosnia and Herzegovina and the decision is made by the government of the Federation on proposal by the line ministry. And depending on the object of concession, the competency for awarding uh, concessions may lie on the cantonal level or the Federation. Cantons are competent for water resources uh, uh, when it comes to construction of small or mini hydropower plants of up to five kilowatts or use of water streams uh, that spread on uh, 
the territory of two or more cantons or construction of uh, small or mini uh, hydropower plants of larger capacities. Here again, concessions are awarded for 30 years or uh, in special cases for 50. At the level of Birchko district, there is the Commission for Concessions of Birchko district, the department that is competent uh, for the area of concession proposes to the mayor and the mayor passes the decision and which has to be approved by the assembly of Birchko district. The contract again uh, is for 30 years. In Republika Srpska, the concession contract is awarded uh, to 50 years. It's a bit longer. The Commission for Concessions of Republika Srpska gives uh, on proposal and the final decision is passed by the government of Republika Srpska. The law on concessions recommends that the concessions uh, they recommend the concessions as it leads to economic development and provides the framework for attracting um, foreign and uh, domestic investments. And uh, at the same time, it improves the transparency of the concession process and increases efficiency and long-term sustainability of concession projects and responsible management of natural wealth and public goods. Currently at the registry of concessions at the webpage of the concession commission, we can see that 328 concessions have been issued. Most of them are for exploitation of construction rock and for use of agricultural land, but concessions for exploitation of water come third. Since we are talking here about the water sector, I uh, also uh, wanted to mention this data for uh, mini hydropower plants. There were 28 mini hydropower plants in the incentive systems and 138 uh, concession contracts were signed for Republika Srpska in the whole of uh, Bosnia-Herzegovina. This number exceeds 400. In all laws on concessions, they define what can be conceded. And these definitions slightly differ between the Federation and the Republic of Srpska. When it comes to water, it's construction, upgrading, and uh, use of uh, canals and ports, hydropower uh, facilities, uh, construction, and use of hydro um, accumulations, uh, fisheries. Uh, um, amelioration system and systems for extraction of different materials from water streams and water use for technological processes in economy. The concessions are awarded in the following way. First, that a tender or public invitation is issued, or sometimes uh, the interested party may start the initiative to receive a concession. We are witnesses in recent times of a large number of campaigns by NGOs mostly and local communities, local population who are objecting or even filing complaints against the concessions, starting the lawsuits against the concessions. When awarding concessions, uh, uh, the rational use of the natural wealth has to be uh, respected and the environment needs to be protected in accordance with the applicable legislation. These are the two points that proved to be, I won't say completely non-complied with, but uh, there is a serious undermining of ecosystem when construction, when constructing uh, mini hydropower plants so, uh, and the minimum flow is not secured, which of course destroys uh, the biocenosis. I will also mention that uh, 
recently a declaration was adopted in Republika Srpska. A similar declaration was adopted in the Federation last year. And I want to, th uh, to congratulate the representatives of NGOs who started this initiative. This declaration requires uh, the uh, stopping of uh, any new concessions until the already awarded concessions really operate in the way they should to re-examine the influence, the impact of the MHPPs. What needs to be done in future is that the law on concessions at the level of Bosnia-Herzegovina is harmonized with the EU directives on concessions so that we, uh, first of all, don't have these different definitions and to make the uh, concession awarding process transparent and to keep regular updates uh, available to all that clearly uh, defines the allocation of revenues. Um, this would be all for me. I have got exhausted my time. As for the legal aspect of concessions in Bosnia-Herzegovina, I want to mention and to invite you, if you are interested in participating in a working group of uh, waters, you have mine and Selma's addresses. And so please join us in uh, developing this strategy and action plan. Thank you, Selma. Thank you, Svetlana. I hope you can hear me now. This was a brief uh, overview of the situation in Bosnia and Herzegovina in this regard. And now the agenda suggests that we should discuss the topic of concessions, experience, uh, uh, social benefits and challenges uh, from the perspective of certain member states. In, uh, uh, we will hear the experience from Sweden, Spain, and Croatia. The first panelist uh, is Mr. Peter Ruderberg. And before uh, I say a few words about him, and you will see his CV on the screen, uh, but before I introduce uh, Mr. Ruderberg, just a logistical point, please. During presentations, you can send your questions on the bottom of your screen. There is a box Q&A. So at any point, if any question occurs to you, you feel free to send your question in through the Q&A box and uh, then we will uh, read your uh, questions and our experts will try to answer them during the discussion session. Good morning, Mr. Peter. Mr. Rudberg is uh, a researcher working uh, at uh, SEI. He is a lead expert for water in the BIH East of 2020. 30 plus. Uh, he holds a PhD from Wageningen University in the Netherlands, uh, where he investigated environmental policy implementation and learning in water governance. His experience uh, and uh, uh, focuses on climate change impacts and adaptation with a focus on the water and wastewater sector. And he also is engaged uh, in researching interactions between the energy and the environmental regulatory regimes in relation to renewable electricity production. May I ask you now, Peter, to share with us uh, Swedish experience on concessions, water concessions. Great, Selma. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's, it's great to be here and to present and to be able to interact with you all. And um, I'm also looking forward to the panel discussion and receiving your questions and being able to explore some of the issues uh, that might be more of interest to you. So we can change the slide, please. 
So when we talk about water concession, it really goes uh, to the heart of this societal question of what to do with our common water resources. And basically, I mean, as we heard from Svetlana as well, the water concession grants an actor the right to use and modify a public resource. And many times when, when there's a decision to grant a, a water concession or not, the economic benefits uh, for the actor are usually tangible and easy to calculate. So it could be, for example, if we're talking about irrigation for agriculture, it's relatively easy to, to calculate how it would be increases in sales and also the quality of agricultural products if you were able to irrigate. Or if we're talking about electricity production uh, with hydropower, there, there is a market for electricity and you could calculate how much electricity you would, you would produce in, in a hydropower station. Uh, and you could make some estimates which would be relatively accurate. When it comes to environmental, accumulative, third party and public impacts, it's much harder to assess or even know what they're gonna be. And it's even harder to monetize them because there's usually not a market uh, for these types of, of services. Uh, so that's, that's an intrinsic challenge that we have when we have to think about what to do with the water resources if we're gonna grant uh, a concession for different uses or not. And it's important because basically one use of water can be very compatible with another. So we're talking about, you know, what are the costs and benefits? It doesn't have to be in, in, you know, in euros, but thinking about what we need uh, and want as a society. And we can switch slides, please. So this is an example of Bindel uh, Elven in the north of Sweden, which is a nationally protected river where there's virtually no new water concessions that are granted and none that have been granted. And as you can see, this is a scenic landscape. You have high environmental values as well as good possibilities for tourism and fishing and hiking. Uh, but of course, you could have you know, exploited this river for hydropower, for example, which is one of the big things we do in Sweden. And uh, can we change the slide again, please? So this is a photo from the Luleå River, which is a bit further north. And what we can see is a flow depleted river section uh, because of uh, diversion for hydropower production. So basically this stretch of river is dry all year round, except for emergency situations when they have to release water. And basically during the last century in Sweden, uh, the Luleå River and several other of the large river systems in Sweden were changed. Uh, basically, they were changed from ecosystems to electricity production systems. Uh, so we have lots of hydropower production and uh, basically the rivers have been completely modified. And this has a very high impact on the landscape. This had a big impact on the indigenous Sami population. Uh, in the photo, I don't know if you can see it, but there's actually three reindeers uh, walking around on the depleted riverbed. And um, basically it's lots of challenges for, for the Sami population with their, their cultural landscapes and their heritage. And then we have you know, the river and ecosystem is not at all uh, <laughs> what it was before. So, so the impacts uh, of granting water concessions for, for, for different uses can be very, very high. But at the same time, Lula River, in this case, it produces roughly 10% of Sweden's total electricity consumption. So, so it's very valuable for the electric system in Sweden and for, for renewable electricity production. Can we switch the slide, please? So in... in, in in 1973, there were some researchers that came up with this term wicked problem, which is basically saying that, you know, there are no optimal technical or scientific solutions that can be found uh, that takes into account all relevant factors. It's, it's very much political, legal, ethical, and economic preferences and trade-offs that are the basis for agreeing to or rejecting different decisions or development paths. So, you know, we, of course we should have uh, 
evaluations and scientific data and do you know impact assessments and so on but it's not going to solve uh, the, the issue and ensure that everybody agrees to it so so these preferences very much are the ones that we have to discuss and come to some sort of agreement and you know preferences are open for discussion and legislation is open to some uh, level of, of interpretation as well so i have this photo if we switch slides and this is just you know a simplistic simplistic illustration but it's it's it kind of goes to the point of saying you know what's the best color well <laughs> it depends we, we can of course uh, have different opinions and you know i like blue uh, but uh, we're not going to find a definite answer to you know what's the best way in every case and and you know somehow we have to we have to find a way of, of dealing with this uh, and maybe not you know expecting uh, you know science and uh, and other actors or, or government actors to have this definite answer that, that we're all gonna to agree to. So if we change again the slide. So this is just, I mean, uh, Svetlana also spoke about this and these are you know, some of these guiding principles that, that we can use in cases where we're dealing with wicked problems. And it's this issue of transparency, which is very important. Uh, deliberation, what we're doing right now, uh, discussion, and you know, having different ideas. Uh, also, the rule of law, ensuring that the, the the legislation in place, both in the country, but also from you know from the from the EU, the ones that apply, are actually followed. If if there's requirements for an environmental impact assessment, well, it should be done. If there's requirements for minimum flows, it has to it has to be done as well. I mean, those are basics that just have to function correctly. Otherwise, it's it's very hard to do you know to ensure that what we're doing is in in the interest of society. And then I think another issue with water concessions, which I think Svetlana also mentioned, uh, it's already the case in, in, in Bosnia and Herzegovina is this issue of time limitation and being able to adjust. And this is also very much related to the difficulty of knowing what the cumulative effects will be, what the un, you know, unknowns are out there, because it's very hard to know exactly what's going to happen if you start uh, taking out water or, or putting dams in, in places. Uh, so you have these unforeseen impacts, you have accumulative effects, and then all of us have to deal with climate change. And, and that is, is making it much more difficult to know what's going to happen and how, you know, what we need to do. Uh, what we're used to from historically is not gonna, it's not correct anymore for the future. So we can't look back, you know, 100 years or 60 years and say, this is how, how this river or this is how much water we've had. Um, traditionally, so we can project towards the future and know that's going to be the case. It's not going to be that case. It's, it's going to be different and we need to uh, adjust to that. And then one issue that I, I push for a lot, and I think, I mean, we're talking about uh, environmental strategy here. So strategic planning uh, is, I think, very important at this case, and I'll come back to that. And then I think also this principle of, of placing the burden of proof on the actor seeking a water concession is also very, very important. So the three last ones, so particularly strategic planning and placing the burden of proof on the actor seeking water concession. I was gonna, I'm going to come back to that later in the presentation and give examples from Sweden. And I'm also giving one example from, from, from the US. Um, so if we can move on, please. So in the background of the decision to grant uh, a water concession or not, we do have some EU you know, rules that are starting to apply to Bosnia and Herzegovina. So it's in the process of approximation. So, I mean, it's it started to apply and transpose, for example, the water EU Water Framework Directive. We have the Sava River Basin Authority set up and working, and that's part of this approximation implementation and there's really i mean three two or three overriding uh, objectives in in the eu water framework directive and the 
I think Svetlana mentioned one, and that's to, to, to reach good status of all water bodies. But actually, uh, which is particularly relevant for Bosnia and Herzegovina because you have such good status of the water body, uh, it's also this issue of non deterioration. Uh, it's, it's not really enough to say, okay, we're going to we're going to get good status everywhere if that means that all these blue rivers that Svetlana showed go to green because then there's this deterioration from the better status right now than good. And that's also something that the Water Framework Directive deals with. Uh, and then we have the issue of good potential in highly modified water bodies, which are the ones that right now uh, have been severely modified. And I mean, in, in Boston Herzegovina, you, you already have, for example, large hydropower stations with dams. Those would be the cases where you would look to reaching good potential, or it could be harbors, or it could be uh, different areas where you've already modified the status of the water historically for, for a good reason, and you have to reach good potential. So it, it is possible with exemptions, uh, but they have to be very well, well detailed and justified. And it's really this issue of, you know, do the societal objectives overrule, you know, is it, is it so important and valuable to modify the, the water? We get so much benefits as a society that then, you know, if we can show that, and if it's well detailed and justified, then, you know, it, it is possible. There are cases, there's been cases in, in for example, Austria, where, where the commission uh, actually tried and the court tried uh, it was a hydropower development project. And in the end, they said, okay, well, it, it was well justified in this case. And, uh, and you know, it was renewable electricity production and so on. So it's not impossible, but it has to be very well detailed and justified. And more lately, it's this issue of uh, do no significant harm, which has uh, come up and is, is becoming a very important uh, issue in the EU. And we have, for example, the Recovery and Resilience Facility Regulation, which is, uh, if you know all this, with the COVID, it's all this money uh, that the EU is 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 uh, ensuring to 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 you know to, to deliver to EU member states that have been hit to uh, to improve the, the the economy and to to restart the economy, and basically they've had this uh, commission had these technical uh, guidance notes on you know how how what sh how should we apply this this do no significant harm to ensure that these this funding doesn't go into sectors and areas that will actually undermine the environmental uh, objectives of the union and basically they they specifically i mean we're talking a lot about hydropower uh, so i know that's one of the big issues here but they actually in these technical guidance notes, they do actually say that, for example, if you know it, it's I'm reading from 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 the text, and it says an activity is considered to do significant harm to the protection and restoration of biodiversity and ecosystems, if it is significantly de de uh, detrimental to the good condition and resilience of ecosystems and detrimental or detrimental to the conservation status of habitats and species, including those of union interest. And they specified, for instance, if a hydropower plant requiring building a dam on an untouched area is assessed, the impact of the dam would be evaluated against a scenario where the concerned river remains in its natural state, rather than considering a different possible alternative use of the area. So if you're, if you think, if you have to, see if, if a proposed um, activity does significant harm, you're actually comparing this new activity with leaving the river as it is in an un, un, altered status. So it's, it's quite significant uh, requirements. Uh, and then you also have on, on a broader level, this, it's still a draft, but it's the tax, taxonomy regulation. And it's looking at, it's trying again to funnel into green investments in the EU. And uh, they also speak about, you know, speak about many things, but hydropower is one of them. Uh, and they, they, they also say, you know, construction of new hydropower plants, it has to be conceived, designed and lo located. So it does not entail any deterioration or significant deterioration of the specific water body. So again, it's, it's moving on an EU level, it's moving towards quite significant uh, requirements to be able to say, okay, we're going to 
have new developments in place, be it hydropower, which is one of the topics we're talking about, or it could be irrigation uh, and so on. So, so, so this is at, the, at the, you know, at back from the EU, it's it's moving towards towards this quite strict requirements uh, if we're going to give new concessions. So if we can change the slide again, please. Yes, yeah, so, um, so when we talk about strategic planning, and I think it's very suitable since we're talking about. I apologize. Uh, yes. I just wanted to uh, thank you for this very interesting presentation, just to warn you of the time. How we much time is it? Five minutes. Okay. Like now, uh, in the beginning, it was 25. I have my timing here, but okay, I'll, I'll finish quickly. So, uh, so it's this issue, where should we have uh, restrictions to granting new water concessions? So, you know, if we have an area with uh, water scarcity already now, maybe it's not the best idea to give concessions for increased irrigation agriculture. If we have water bodies with high status and with endemic aquatic species, well, maybe those stretches uh, and areas and water bodies are not the best place to construct new hydropower. In Sweden, so if we're moving, we have uh, strategic strategy planning and uh, basically in Sweden it's uh, it's an ongoing process and it's looking I mean the basics is saying that you know large scale hydropower plants should be refurbished and if it's possible uh, the capacity should be increased and I think here it's important to distinguish between large scale dam hydropower and small scale run of the river hydropower so the smaller ones don't have this capacity to regulate. Basically, it's it, it's very similar to other um, re variable renewable electricity sources such as wind power, biofuels, or, or well, actually biofuels you can control, but wind power and solar power is very similar in the sense that it, it produces when it produces. In the case of run or river hydropower, it produces as the water flows. With large scale dam hydropower, which has a bigger impact, but you also have this capacity of actually regulating the production in accordance to the needs of, of electricity consumption, because that's changing all the time. And you need to have the capacity to regulate production to be in line with that. And uh, so basically in Sweden, the biggest ones, the strategy says, you know, let's, let's refurbish them and increase the capacity. And the small scale we have, uh, you know, around, 2,000 hydropower stations in Sweden, 200 of those are the big ones, and the rest, 1,700, 1,800 are small. And, and for all of those, it has to reach good ecological status. And that's, you know, fauna passages, uh, minimum flow, and in many cases, it will lead to dam removal as well, because it's just not worth continuing to, 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 to produce if you, uh, you know, put on these, these strict environmental requirements. So there's virtually no new hydropower plants, and we have these national no-go zones, for example, Vindelelven, which was the example I gave before. So if we change the slide. So this is just an example. The, 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 the darker the color, the more valuable is the river basin, the hydropower production in that river basin. So this is the map of Sweden. So you can see how they're looking. The ones that are lighter in color or white are the ones where there's less value for, for the electric system and you know more uh, elect, uh, more energy oops, sorry more environmental measures uh, would be required in those areas if we switch the slide again so this is uh, just the time scales so it's over the next 20 years the bluer the color the closer in time the, all the hydropower stations in that area are going to be tried and it goes to court of law and so on on the, the more red Reddish colors are later, that's towards the end of the 2030s. But it's an example and it's a big process going on in Sweden right now and where it's, you know, we can, we can, we can discuss if the, the strategy is correct or if the, how, you know, if it should be more or less of something, but at least it's this, this way of thinking, which I think is, is, is uh, positive. Uh, and if we switch, so this is placing the burden of proof uh, on the actor seeking a water concession. And uh, basically, 
it's just this issue that you know we have environmental impact assessment and strategic environmental assessment directives that apply to new particularly new energy uh, developments in the country and uh, it's this issue that well actually in those studies potentially affected stakeholders should have an, 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 a, a possibility to ask for reasonable uh, studies and explorations. And if we find that, you know, it's maybe not the best decision, of course, it should be an acceptable option not to grant a concession in a particular area, even though we've started working towards that. So if we switch again, so this is an example from the US where they have this process. It's non-federal hydropower projects, a time limit, and basically the, the, the hydro, if, even if you've had a hydropower station before, and right now they're in the process, it's, it's ongoing in the US, the, when a concession ends, if the actor wants to continue to produce hydropower, for example, in that basin, they have to show that this is actually the best option for this basin. And you have to evaluate different options, which could be environmental, uh, hiking, uh, recreation, and uh, also, of course, ensure that it's in line with existing environmental legislation. And with this process, virtually all hydropower stations in the US are modified, and there are various stations that are removed. Um, and if we give an example, if we switch and I'm almost finishing now. Um, so this is the um, Sturgeon River in Michigan an area with high environmental and recreational values and you know they had to to apply for a new concession it expired and it just came to the to the conclusion in this process that actually that the, the other values of, of of juices of this river basin were actually higher value than continuing hydropower production so with that if we switch again i'm finished feel free to contact me uh, it's been great to be able to present for you thank you selma i'll hand it over to you Thank you, Peter, for this uh, very interesting presentation. We already have some uh, questions in our box, in our chat box. We will leave it for the question and answer session. So we will ask you to share some uh, uh, of the information with us. Our second panelist who will present is Ms. Alida Ban Pavlovic. Ms. Alida Ban Pavlovic is an expert from Croatia. She has uh, over 20 years of experience on numerous pro projects uh, in the process of uh, approximation to the EU and she worked in the countries in the region, such as uh, Serbia, Montenegro, Bosnia, Herzegovina and Armenia. She was uh, a participant in the project related to compliance with the harmonization of the uh, Croatian legislation with the EU legislation. Those were the CARDS project strategy for uh, environmental law approximation and supporting the accession process of the candidate countries. Ms. Alida. Since 2012, she's uh, the senior, a key senior legal expert on long-term uh, project of European Commission, the framework contract for conformity checking. And in May 2019, she was named the head of Department for Environmental Law, Policy and Economics at Oikon Company. Ms. Alida, welcome. And I will now kindly ask you to give the presentation that we agreed on and that you had prepared. It has to do uh, with the concessions uh, for water use and the experiences of Croatia. Good morning, Ms. Cengic, uh, and thank you for this very kind uh, introduction. And thank you to all the panelists and Professor Volic and Ms. Peter Rydberg for this very interesting information. And I will be happy to follow on. Yeah, we can hear her. Everything is fine. 
Ms. Alida, we cannot hear you right now. Can you unmute your microphone? Okay, now again. Uh, can you hear me now? Thank you. I propose uh, that I turn off uh, my camera because my internet connection is unstable and the, everything will be much better if I uh, switch off my video. So if you did not hear me, Ms. Cengic, thank you for this kind introduction. Thank you to the previous panelists, uh, Professor Lovic and uh, Mr. Peter, uh, for mentioning these very important things that are related to concessions and water protection. And I will follow up on that in my short presentation. My presentation is uh, quite complex in terms of uh, uh, normal technology and I will, I don't think I will have time to go through it. I will quickly go uh, to some of the pages to try to share some of the information that are not necessarily found here. As a person with many years of experience in harmonization of national legislation with the EU legislation, this is the first point that is important to, to be mentioned. It was important for Croatia. Our countries have had hundreds of years of tradition in water protection, as opposed to some other possibly countries a newer generation of EU member countries who passed their own first laws on protection of water in the 90s and established the uh, first institutions, I mean the Baltic Tigers and Bulgaria and Romania, they, they joined the EU much uh, earlier than we did without uh, having the legislation. Croatia has been uh, through a very difficult period of transposition and harmonization of the existing Croatian uh, legislation and institutions. In the uh, attempts to uh, comply with the EU requirements, but I will mention some details later on. According to the constitution of Croatia, water in nature is considered a good of interest for Croatia and enjoys special protection. The ways how the water can be used and utilized in Croatia and the restrictions of these rights are uh, determined by law. We have this right to general use of water, which uh, says that everybody is allowed to use water for their personal needs in the quantities and in ways that do not exclude others. And this applies only to the surface waters and the first layer of ground waters. We must mention the resolution of the European Parliament on uh, right to water, declaring the right to water and sanitation a human, a fundamental human rights. However, the legal organization regulates the water uh, beyond this limit, then we have order of priorities for the purposes of use of water, and uh, all these rights can be restricted in extreme situations as it happens uh, when there is a temporary shortage of water. And there are two main laws that are applicable in Croatia. That's the law on the waters, as the Lex Specialis, and uh, law on, and if something is not regulated there, it uh, applies the law on concessions as the Lex Generalis. I uh, see that some panelists are complaining that they cannot hear me. We have some interruptions, but it's fine. As you can see, the numbers of the official gazettes, these are very recent laws. The law on water was adopted in 2019 and amended in 2020, and we have this special regulation on the use of water. What I'd like to share with you, which is not on the slide, was this procedure of harmonization. It was uh, quite uh, problematic for Croatia. We didn't have a perfect uh, intersectoral uh, cooperation, the water's uh, responsibility for water is divided between environment, water, which is 
with the ministry, we have this uh, strong agency for water protection. So we had to apply horizontal coordination with respect to other uh, directives like Inspire Habitats uh, and others strategic uh, environmental impact assessment and we uh, at some point lost our way and uh, Croatia got exhausted in this process of transposition we were trying to patch up we did the patchwork transposition and if we went back maybe it would have been wiser if we sat together as a, a cross-sectoral team and opened uh, a word document and wrote it all from the beginning while we were exhausting ourselves financially and in terms of human capacities, working with all these capacities in the transposition process, we failed to pay good enough attention to the establishment and improvement of the instruments. So very quickly, we found ourselves in the situation that our uh, regulations are sufficiently uh, approximated, but the institutions were not uh, able to implement these demanding and expensive directives the directive on potable water drinking water and for the uh, sanitary waters are very expensive uh, and and we got lost a little bit in terms of financial and uh, human resource capacities and i received information from the ministry that implementation of these directives the drinking water and urban wastewater that by the end of the transition periods we've spent 28 billion kuna. Today, in view of the European Union, they are well implemented. However, some of the monitoring results conducted so far show that Croatia still has a strong pollution problem, pollution from different sources, and I mean uh, agriculture and municipal wastewaters. And this is, we can go quickly through this. This, uh, this is the list of all activities related to use of waters that require concessions. I think and we can proceed. You can come back to this and read. This is a similar slide, uh, specific conditions, uh, legal, technical conditions for concessionary to fulfill uh, in order to get the concessions and what are the most important legal or technical conditions we can continue also there are two procedures for giving concessions uh, public uh, invitation and uh, on direct uh, uh, application uh, for uh, the public uh, tender uh, these are uh, more valuable projects of uh, production or generation of electricity, exploitation of sand and gravel, and all concessions that uh, use water on a public water good. These direct on require, request uh, are usually started by the owner or holder of the right on uh, property for some activity that has something to do with water. We have also concessions the, in order for a concessionary to acquire a uh, concession must uh, have the decision and the contract on concession. It's important to say that concessioner here never becomes the owner of this good, only acquires the right to use it over a specific period of time. And very often people think that somebody acquired a, a source of water in, as their own property, which can never be allowed. And again, different types of concessions, uh, depending on the type, uh, different levels pass the decision. The Croatian parliament uh, passes decision on the more powerful hydro power plant, the government uh, for uh, somewhat uh, lower power power plants and the uh, mineral geothermal waters. For lower activities, it, it is the Ministry of uh, Economy and Sustainable Development. And for some categories of individuals who may not need uh, the concession, just the permit to use the water, they are issued such a, a permit by the Croatian waters, Hrvatske Vode as an institution. This is 
interesting how active we are with respect to this a bit more than bosnia over the past four years we've seen a trend uh, that we issue around uh, 500 concessions and the concessions are issued for the period 30 to 60 years i don't have this uh, information here and now but if you want to know we can we can share with you what uh, types of concessions are mostly represented here well this is a uh, very important protection of waters and this is uh, in line with the presentation by mr peter rudberg to what extent this uh, politics uh, economy law will involve the elements of water protection as we know this is a very lucrative sector but at the same time it, it is uh, a fundamental human rights because we cannot live without water so whatever it is it is necessary to always make sure that the any deterioration of the water status is prevented and also to prevent when issuing uh, the permits uh, further degradation of waters uh, to follow up on what professor lalic has said we introduced the one of the reasons for the termination of the concession contracts we added the one specific reason and that is the termination by the concessionaire uh, if uh, some changes to the water regime have been observed uh, significantly deteriorating the water status what will happen is that the concessionaire will be bound in order to prevent further deterioration to add some new technical and preventative elements and at some point this may uh, make it uh, economically uh, in effective and the, they will have the right to to terminate the concession contract in order to prevent further degradation of the water regime and uh, here these are some this is a recommendation regarding the existing permits and uh, alignment with the framework water directive and I will go back to the uh, process of transposition. Uh, it's important that not only the framework water directive, uh, Professor Lalic mentioned the directive on awarding concession contracts from 2014. The process is very complex and all these directives must be taken into consideration. And my advice, most sincere, would be that you start from the definitions that really have to be harmonized and literally reflect and transposed in your legislation. For the first 10 years, I worked in Croatia on the process of approximation of the law. And the, past, uh, the last 10 years, I'll watch from the other side of the fence. Uh, on behalf of the European Union, I uh, follow what others do. And they are very strict about the um, transposition. If your definitions are not uh, right to start with, then uh, other things will not work. Just to repeat, and with this I will uh, finish. I have a couple of more technical slides, but you can read them yourselves. I think uh, this is about uh, what's the total revenue, uh, 70 million kunas and what are the financial liabilities and i will conclude with the advice with a piece of advice be wise and learn from our mistakes and transposition it cost a lot of money and uh, time and uh, many failures and it took us unfortunately we did not have uh, some good examples some other member countries joined the eu much easier than we did but I expect you will have the similar process. Try to simplify. And as I, it's not a problem to adopt the new law. I think sometimes it's easier than to try to patch up uh, the old ones because every time it will fall apart. And uh, in this uh, context, I want to say that we are here 
for you. You can address us. We will always be happy to help you in any way we can. And with this, I will uh, finish my presentation. I hope I stuck uh, with the, the time lot that was uh, given to me. I have to leave you. I will not uh, be able to stay for the panel discussions, but if you have any specific questions about the waters in Croatia, please send them by email and deal, we will make sure to find uh, appropriate persons to give you the answers as well as any other assistance that you may need. Miss, Mrs. Ban, thank you very much for this very useful presentation and what you shared with us. Uh, it is very important for us because this is about Croatia, our neighboring country. And it is also this, these advice that you shared with us are very important. I hope that we will be able to learn from your mistakes and to ask you and other consultants from Croatia. So goodbye. The questions uh, for your presentations will be passed on. Thank you very much. It was very interesting. According to our agenda, we should have a short break now. And uh, let's make it shorter than in this. So let's meet at 10.15, some seven, eight minutes break. So 10.15, we'll start with the next presentation. Thank you. Welcome back to the second part of the webinar. I hope uh, you had time for making sure you're comfortable. Our next presentation and the next panelist uh, will speak about the experience from Spain, legal arrangements, uh, legal uh, infrastructure and concessions uh, in Spain. This will be interesting be because Spain is uh, a leader in water management in terms of the number of concessions and types of concessions that were granted. Uh, Professor Pedro Brufao acts as an advisor on water, environmental energy, and public issues for both public and private organizations. Uh, Mr. Pedro holds a PhD in administrative law from uh, University Carlos III in Madrid and uh, in Spain, and uh, he uh, obtained a LL um, in energy and environmental law from Tulane University Fulbright Program USA. He's professor of administrative law at the University of Extremadura in Spain. Mr. Brufal, back to you. Thank you, so much. Thank you so much for the invitation to take part in this seminar. Well, I will try to explain Spanish water law, which is sometimes very difficult to 
to comprehend to comprehend all the issues that involve uh, the water permit regime in Spain and the use of water in general. So I will try to translate into normal English or normal language all the clues of um, our Spanish water law regime. Well, as you can see in the second slide, there are a, a handful of uh, water regimes in Spain because uh, of the historic point of view of the development of water law in my country. For example, if we could say um, perhaps 70 or 75 percent of it, the Spanish current water law regime comes from Roman law, which is very important to, to take in account because there are private uses, issues that we have to handle every day. For example, now the main law is the 1985 Water Act, now the 2001 Water Act, that uh, explains the legal, the general framework of water law in my country. Besides, we've got also civil rules and historic water rights rules, for example. Now we have to use historic water rights rules dating back to middle age to comprehend current irrigations right in my country. That's um, a clue that sometimes people forget, but it's very, very important to, to get a clue to the current situations in, in Spain. Also, we've got a um, very influence, a very hard influence of the administrative point of view. The main example is the 2001 Hydrological Plan Act, which in a kind of general overview of the use of water in the country, try to comprehend all the water use and the actual the current situation in terms of hydrological issues, environmental issues, uh, consumption, urban development, induced industrial uses of water, and so on and so forth, which is sometimes um, a kind of illusion because it's so difficult to comprehend and to, to abide by the law, including all the general uses of water in Spain, because we've got thousands of thousands of thousands uh, of water use, uses in my in my country alone all the all the bases in in Spain which are sometimes very difficult to to include in just one act and in relation to this plan hydrological planet of 20 years ago we've got a, a bunch of royal decrees uh, which developed all these plans and now, as we can, we have seen already, we've got uh, water free world directive and others directed like pollution, floods, uh, fishing, uh, air, and so on and so forth. And we've got another restriction of uses because we share almost all the bases with Portugal and we have assigned a bilateral uh, agreement with Portugal uh, called the Albufeira Convention which is mainly um, an international treaty um, in relation to hydropower use of the River Tagus, the River Minho, uh, the Guadiana, and, and the Duero Basin rivers. It's a treaty uh, the, aiming at dividing the hydropower use at the border of Portugal and Spain. And we also have the Habitat Directive and sometimes fishing acts, fishing acts that uh, have a great influence of water uses, mainly hydropower. Then the next uh, slide, the number four the slide, uh, I point here that generally fresh water is public. Fresh water is public. This is the, the main issue of the current water law regime in Spain but sometimes forget the order, the historical use, which present water law as a private one. For example, you can see here in the, 
slide number four, and this is a, a sign, a sign by the road, that, that road at the, on, at the left, uh, which says it's a, the image of a legal issue uh, held at the Supreme Court 20 years ago that declares all of this land, which was a wetland, a wetland in the Guadiana River Basin, uh, which declared this patch of land, this round, so this round patch of land, you can see they are irrigated in, in, in the summer as a public property. But the owner, the former owner, insists on the private property of this tract of land. As you can see, it's quite uh, weird to see by the road a sign like a um, property register uh, inclusion of a uh, uh, some hectares of land properties 100 percent private by this called evangelist uh, company uh, agriculture company uh, sometimes it's quite difficult to uh, to know just to to have a hint of uh, the legal regime of every tract of land of every water use in spain in the next slide number five uh, we can see also the main problems of the use of water law under the water law regime in my country because 80% of the water is used for agricultural purposes and sometimes illegal. Not, um, it's not very rare to have uh, and to face uh, illegal water use of, for agricultural purposes in my country. Um, then we have the problem of transitory, transitory, transitory provision provisions in water law parents. And now we've got another problem because all the concessions granted perhaps 100 years ago, 150 years ago, are now coming to an end. Coming to an end and we will see what is the destiny of these concessions coming to an end. And this problem is not faced by the private water holders of uh, water issues in in my country because because uh, when we see that private water uh, is still under the property of uh, irrigation companies or irrigation communities it can be sold or rented or whatever in as a private business issue then we can see the, the, the problem, the main problem of illegal uses in, in my country. As you can see in the, in the photograph, in the left photograph, there are thousands and thousands and thousands of hectares illegally irrigated in my country. This is the, the image of uh, under plastic uh, greenhouses, hectares of berries and so on near the Doñana National Park, perhaps the most protected uh, area in Spain. Also in the Miel, in the very center of my country, the southeast, and of course in along the Mediterranean seashore with thousands and thousands of illegal wells. For example, in the city of Almeria, around the city of Almeria, uh, 30 years ago, uh, the aquifer was declared overexploited when it had and it supported the irrigation of around 3,500 hectares. Now they are under plastic, perhaps 40,000, with the same overexploited aquifer. Uh, in relation to public water use, we've got another separation of regimes. All the use under 7,000 uh, 7, uh, cubic meters per year is free and without permission. Over that amount of water per year, we need a water concession, a water concession that belongs to the holder and it can be registered in the, we call the Registro de la Propiedad, property registers in my country. In my country, I can use, I can be used a private asset for a mortgage or whatever, yeah? or to hold a credit from a bank or another uh, private use. We've got another limit 
what a permit holder must be the owners of the land. This is a very important issue that restrict the use of water in the country because no, there is no more important restriction of, uh, of the use of water in my, in my country than being the owners of the land, which is a limit uh, to the commercial use, use of water. Of course, we've got hydropower and other industrial use of water permit at concession, which is um, much more restricted, perhaps up to 75 years or uh, currently 50 years and so on. And now we face the closing down of nuclear power and therm and uh, coal uh, power um, plants and paper mills plants and, and other industrial uses they are coming to an end and now we've got a problem uh, about the the uses of those uh, track of land of those urban planning around the rivers in spain in the eighth slide We've got a general 75 year period use granted by the water bodies in Spain. Uh, but now there are hundreds, perhaps we don't know the exact amount of hydro power permits. They are coming to, to an end or, have, or they have already expired uh, nowadays. As you can see in the, in the left photograph, this is near Seville, the city of Seville, the Guadalquivir, the Guadalquivir River. There is a a huge hydropower plant and um, perhaps um, this plant will have to be removed after the the end of the of the period granted by the water permits in the 30s of the 20th century and which is the the first solution given by the law demolition demolition uh, turning down a dam is now becoming not very often but not very rare for example we can see here the demolition the um, the demolition taken in perhaps two years ago or three years ago in a of a dam near the border of portugal it's the first legal options uh, we've got another problem with the hydropower dams perhaps uh, the state or the regional government uh, can Handed over this uh, exploitation of for hydropower purposes to another company in an auction, and we've got another problem with water bodies and the law because they are very uh, bureaucratic bodies. Uh, uh, we they lack uh, staff, they lack budget, they lack perhaps an environmental point of view in the day-by-day -day work and perhaps within a reform of this water body aiming at the general fulfillment of the water framework directive of all the ecological requirements placed by the habitat directive they are poorly financed they have inadequate budgets lack of staff as said before and a very low level of water transaction we can on the contrary, be understood that the hidden subsidies, mainly for agriculture and energy uses. And of course, there are all also industrial urban agriculture policies to foster water abuse that they promote in the in the buildings, in the very same buildings of the water bodies and the lobby companies, the lobby of industrial urban agricultural companies uh, want to foster in the same water bodies in Spain. Um, that's all. And sorry for my English. We have uh, grown a, a pretty big layer of rust. And uh, I will uh, I will thank all the questions that you can ask me later. Thanks so much. That's all. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Dufar. We listened to your, carefully your presentation, and it was interesting to hear that, unfortunately, you have a very specific uh, problems uh, 
you face uh, specific problems uh, while you have been a member state of the EU for quite a long time. But as uh, Ms. Ban said, now we have an opportunity to learn from failures and mistakes of some EU members. And uh, I do hope that uh, we will be able to use uh, some of the experience you shared with us in this presentation. On our agenda, we have now some time for discussion until 11.20. So we have uh, some 40, 45 minutes uh, for discussion. We have Mr. Peter and uh, Mr. Brufao available for your questions, uh, but uh, Ms. Alida, as we already explained, will not be able to answer questions now, but uh, any questions you may have for her will be passed to her. Now let's start uh, with the discussion and uh, let's try to answer questions we received. Uh, we have 16 questions. I've uh, uh, scrolled the questions and uh, I saw that there are some questions regarding Bosnia and Herzegovina. I would kindly ask uh, the participants for patience and uh, I would uh, prefer if we take questions directed to our panelists first. Uh, we should use their presence and then if we have time, uh, we will answer the questions regarding Bosnia and Herzegovina. If you agree, let's start uh, with the first question. The first question was, uh, the investor explains uh, their requirements to the level of the government, which grants concessions, uh, environmental permits, and that would be the ministry, depending on which level. This was a commentary related to Bosnia and Herzegovina. Then the next question, uh, now we will not answer this question. This uh, is information uh, which is rather internal. Mr. Viktor Bielic is uh, asked uh, the question in English and uh, I will read it. Whether it comes to public legal administrative contracts or private legal obligation. To whom is the, the question, sorry? This question, I think, relates to the presentation made by Peter. So if Peter could uh, say something about this. Uh, Salma, could you please uh, repeat? And I think it's probably easiest because I have translation on all the time. And then if you if you yes. if you if you speak in in I will read it in English. Okay, so then please do it again. Again, uh, how is the legal framework for concessions regulated? Whether it comes to public legal administrative contracts or private legal obligation contract. Okay, so, so in Sweden, and, and it's quite interesting when we hear that in, in Spain, we're somewhere between private and public, uh, water being somewhere between private and public, and in, in, the, in, in Bosnia and Herzegovina and also Croatia, it's, it's public. In Sweden, it's private. Basically, it's 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 uh, I think it's a historical tradition also from the fact that we've had a lot of water in Sweden. We have a lot of water in Sweden, so it's not been a big issue. And it's it's uh, so it's a it's it's a private uh, property also related to the land, and it's formally a permit. So mm -hmm. there's these differences between you know concessions and permits, mm -hmm. and uh, so it's it's a permit that's granted in a court of law. Uh, and historically, we've had water courts uh, that have granted these uh, concessions. It's almost only been for hydropower production in Sweden, so during the last century. And historically, these, these uh, permits were granted with no time limit. And that's something that the EU 
with the Water Framework Directive has been pushing Sweden to change. And that's part of the reason why we have the one I presented with this strategy uh, to, to review all the permits. But basically it's, it's uh, I mean, the water is, is, is private connected to the land and you get a permit to use it uh, where during that permit, you look at different, you know, well now, uh, before you didn't look too much at the environment, but you looked at different third, third person effects, if someone were affected downstream or upstream, or if you're damming and so on. So, so it's been gone, gone through that uh, and, and it's public. I mean, you can, in Sweden, transparency is very good. So, so you can get access to that um, information. So I hope that's an answer. Well, Peter. Thank uh, you, Peter. We have uh, several more questions uh, for Sweden, for Peter. In the presentation that you gave, the question is, in the part where you talk about the Swedish national plan, what do you mean by uh, reviewing the permits? I think you touched upon this in your earlier answer, but please, could you elaborate on it a little bit? What do you include under this uh, review or revision of permits? Yeah, great, thanks. Um, so basically in, in Sweden, uh, the, ex, the, the permits that were given for hydropower were given between, you know, in the 50s, 1950s, 1960s, 1970s, and they were all granted according to a law, water law from 1918. So they were, it's a, you know, more than a hundred year old law and the, the permits that were granted uh, during the 50s and 60s and 70s and 40s, uh, what you basically looked at was third party effects. So if someone, you know, downstream was affected economically, they would get some compensation. Uh, so that was what the court really looked at, you know, who was directly affected. And of course, in the 50s and 60s, there were no like environment as a concept didn't exist really. So the, the, the environmental provisions are lacking in most cases. And, and we have a, from that period of time, a very aggressive uh, exploitation of rivers where you could, you know, you have dams and you can have zero flows. And, and basically, as, as I commented, uh, you know, riverine ecosystems were converted into electric systems really it, it, all the flows and everything is related to 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 the electric uh, system requirements so with the water framework directive and with these processes and also the commission the eu commission has been pushing sweden to say that uh, you know you can't have permits that are forever and really hard to change which was the case in sweden because the permits from the 50s and 60s the conditions in those permits are still valid today. Right now, as we speak, hydropower is being produced in Sweden according to the permits that were granted in the 50s, uh, according to a law from 1918. So, so, so that's not great, I think, and the commission um, didn't think that was great either. So what's happening now is they're saying you should have modern environmental conditions uh, or provisions, sorry, modern environmental provisions in all permits. Uh, so that is kind of the basis. And to be modern environmental provisions, it has to be maximum 40 years old. So after this first 20 year period, the idea is that every 40 years, we're gonna review those, uh, those, those conditions for the environment that are in there. So basically it, it's a whole, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a very, very complex, but I think it's, it's quite a, 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 a good way of doing it. Again, you can discuss if, if, if the limits and what those restrictions are, if that's the right ones. But I think the process is, is relevant and good because they're, they're saying, you know, the big stations should be granted uh, exemptions according to the EU Water Framework Directive. So there is this possibility of saying that the big stations, the ones with dams that can regulate, which are much more valuable to the electric system than the small ones that can't regulate those should not have big environmental, you know, you shouldn't have fish passages there or, or minimum flows because you're going to lose so much uh, hydro, hydropower production. In the small ones, so they're saying that, you know, okay, all the small ones have to reach good ecological status. And that's, you know, we'll see when we come to court, but basically that means having fish passages and minimum flows on all stations. 
And in Sweden, they've done this financial agreement of lowering the tax of, of hydropower production units. Uh, and then the, the eight biggest hydropower producers have created a fund, which has actually quite a lot of money. But I mean, the tax, the tax cuts were, were bigger than the money in the fund. The tax cuts were about uh, 190 million euros a year. And the fund is about 50 million euros a year for improvements. And when a small hydropower producer goes to court and they say, you have to have a fist patch that you have to do all these investigations, you have, all, have to do all that. That hydropower producer can apply to this fund and get 90% coverage of all the costs. And that includes removing the dam because it could be that you say it's, it's not worth, you know, maybe it's, it's a very, you know, high value environmental value and maybe it's not profitable anymore. Then the hydropower producer can say, okay, Let's just tear it out. We, we agree. I agree to removing the dam, and they get 90% coverage of, of all foregone production income. So they say, okay, so we calculate how much you would produce in the next 20 years, and we do you know a percentage or whatever, and they say, okay, so it's valued as this much. All the production that you're going to lose is you know one hundred thousand euros. And then they say, okay, we're going to pay you 90,000 euros from this fund. So it's, it's, it is, a, it is, I mean, it's still not simple, but they have dealt with many of the issues that can mean that when you go to court of law, it just gets gridlocked, right? like you want to remove gridlock. And one of the ways to do that is through economic means. So, yeah, I think that's, that's an explanation, I hope. Um, Ms. Chenkic's uh, microphone is off. I can see her speaking, but we can hear nothing. I apologize, you uh, couldn't hear me. Peter, I think we have uh, another question for you. Do you, well, in Sweden, are the water concession given, uh, water concessions given uh, in accordance with the general law on concessions or in accordance with the law on water? Which law applies to concessions on water? So I think, uh, uh, so here you have to differentiate between what is going on right now and what happened 80 years ago when most of the hydropower was, the, most of the concessions for hydropower were granted in Sweden. And right now in Sweden, we have an environmental code, which, uh, you know, has lots of, so it's, it's a special code for the environment that, that kind of has drawn in all these different sub areas of environmental legislation in Sweden and so new concessions or permits in the Swedish case are, 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 are granted according to that uh, and those and in that environmental code we have very high standards and it's you know it's 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 strict requirements but the thing in Sweden is there's not many new hydropower stations being built uh, what we have is we have a huge stock of uh, hydropower stations that were built built in the 50s and 60s and 70s. And those hydropower concessions or permits were granted according to the water law of 1918. Um, so it's a very, very old law. And I think, again, re reflecting on what, what uh, Pedro Brufau, Pro Professor Brufau was saying, that law was meant to allow for exploitation of water resources. Uh, it, it was really... Uh, it was really the main objective was to allow for a rapid and big construction of, of, of hydropower in Sweden. And, you know, it's, it's been very valuable. Sweden, Sweden is, you know, the top hydropower producer in, in the EU, uh, but it's come to with a very, very high cost. And, and that's the issue now that those permits from the 50s and 60s were granted with no time limit. And that's the issue then. If you wanted a change to change an old permit, 
you could have a public agency going in and asking for a fish passage, but the burden of proof in the court of law was on that public agency. So it's very, 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 very difficult to change any of these old concessions. And that's what's changing now when you have a requirement. And that's also to place the burden of proof on the actor that wants to use the water resources, which I think is, is happening now in Sweden as well with this new plan, because it's saying every 40 years, the hydropower producer has to show that you know they're, they're aligning to environmental legislation, be it the Water Framework Directive or be it Swedish environmental uh, legislation. So, so it is this special legislation before, the water law, which was very much aimed at allowing for hydropower construction, and right now we have uh, the uh, environmental code. But again, almost everything was constructed during the last century. So, so the, the, the influence of this water law from 1918 was almost complete. Uh, it, it was just minor, you know, some stations that had this new, according to the environmental code. Uh, and that is changing now with this process that's going to happen during the next 20 years. Thank you, Peter. I will use my privilege to ask a sub question related to this. It is clear. You explained it very clearly how the permits are issued, but uh, it's interesting. How do you go about concessions? Do you have the law on concessions? Do you have the institutions, commissions? Do, do you have them at all? And one thing is the permit concession is a completely different matter. So do you integrate the permits uh, and do you take them into account uh, in some regulations on concessions? And what are the bodies that grant the concession based on these permits, uh, I assume? Thank you. So I think we, we go into this issue of, of of water being a public uh, resource or a private resource. And I think in Sweden, it tends towards a private resource, so which is connected to the land, which means that what you need is a permit, which is slightly different from a concession, because as, as the presenter said, a concession is the right to use a resource. Uh, in, in this case, if you own the land, you own the water, and then you get a permit uh, which is also a legal, you know, a legal right yeah. to do something, but you get the right to 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 modify that water, uh, which has effects on other people. So that what 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 you do is you go to a court of law, which is in in Sweden right now. It's the land and environmental law, which is part of the regular court system. So when you when you go um, when you when you um, when you have a ruling and you you question that ruling, it moves up to, to the second level, which is the environmental uh, superior court. But then if you continue um, subpoenaing and, and going up, you go to the to the um, uh, to the um, to the superior court, the general superior court in Sweden, if it tries it. So it's part of the general court system in Sweden. Uh, it's one branch of it. And so it's in the end, it's it's the court of law that decides what is allowed to do with that, and it grants a permit. And priorly, you know, 50 years ago, it was uh, these water courts. Uh, and the, the 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 key there is again is that mm -hmm. those concept those permits were eternal. There was no time limit. You could change them, but then you would have to have an active intervention by someone else. Who then got all the burden of proof and evidence to change it so it's very hard to change but that has changed now uh, starting 2019 with this new process and, and putting the burden off so so all these permits now in the next 20 years are going to the land and environmental court of sweden and they're going to give a new the court court permit uh, for that Peter. <laughs> Thank you Peter, for this additional explanation. Next questions pertain to the situation in Croatia. So we will not read them out. They will be passed on to the Croatian 
authorities. Uh, we have a question for Peter. Peter Rudberg, if you could say, if you know, what is the average uh, concession fee per produced megawatt of electricity? The same question applies to Croatia, but uh, Peter, if you have information, could you please share it with us? So in Sweden, there's no concession fees, as in there's, there's, a, there's a tax mm -hmm. on the property. So if you have a hydropower station, there's a tax of that facility that's in there uh, working. And, and that was part of this agreement where actually traditionally hydropower stations have been taxed quite high because they're so profitable, particularly the big ones. So, so they, they had around 1.8%, I think, tax. Um, and, and, and in this agreement that were a couple of years ago, there was a political agreement and they also wanted to incentivize um, the big hydropower producers not to kind of block uh, block progress and they said okay we're gonna we're gonna reduce your tax uh, and then you know if we reduce your tax and it was reduced from 1.8 percent to 0.5 percent uh, of the production value then you know let's you should create this fund that will pay for 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 measures in the smaller stations so there's no fee uh, as, long, as far as i know there's a tax on on the property uh, that's there wow well, peter Not thank you peter the next questions the uh, several questions pertain to the situation in Bosnia and Herzegovina, we will skip them now and we will continue with the questions that uh, are uh, for Peter and Mr. Brufau. For Mr. Brufau, question regarding the presentation by Professor Brufau in the part of the public consumption of water, water permit it equals with concession. Is this uh, the regulation or was it uh, a translation error? It's the question I thought that that question was for me because I, I haven't gotten the translation into English, sorry. I will repeat a question. In the part which uh, of your presentation, which discusses the public water consumption, the water permit is equalized with concession. Was it the problem of translation on the slide or is it the regulation in the law in Spain? Because I, I don't have the translation into into English of those questions. If you press on the bottom, you have the like next to um, grabar. Grabar here. English, English. Ah, okay. They asked me for permission to the host of this meeting. Uh, I, I cannot see Mark. it. Sorry, I'm very sorry. Of course, can we ask uh, our support team to allow Professor Brufau to hear translation into English? I forgot all the list of questions and answers. Uh, yeah. Sorry, but I cannot hear. Call using internet audio. I'm sorry about that. I'm not able Mr. to, I to solve this. <laughs> 
Selma, maybe you could read in English if, if he hears to if you just say the the question uh, in English. A general overview of the question. Um, Selma, must the uh, Da ja pročitam na engleskom. Evo probat ću ja ovaj biti jasan. So I will so, try. I will try to read this uh, or comment in English. So I I I and So within your presentation one slide which it was written uh, public uh, water consumption in one slide, it is the the water permit was in fact equal to water concession. So, is it problem with the translation, or that is really uh, according to the law that water uh, uh, permit same as concession? Thank yes. you. In general, water permit or water concession is the same in Spain. It's the same. It depends on the use for agricultural purposes, for industrial or urban uses. So we need to have a water concession for uh, the concept conception itself, the concession of sale of water, which means its transformation into energy, into agricultural products, or into urban use conception. We need a, another thing called authorization just for lower level of use, which is much more, uh, is much easier to, to give, to hand it over to private, uh, to private companies or to private users. But in general, water concession and water permit is the same in general. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, I, I would, I would, if if we still have problem, I would continue the next question because it is also a question for you. Okay. I have a, sorry. I have pressed a button here called interpretation in English. So uh, in your great, <laughs> great. Excuse me. Uh, then I will read the, the question in English. How do you currently control the illegal use of water oh. and this in this area regulated in, in Spain? Well, this is a very good question. Uh, to control the water okay. uses. Uh, in Spain, we have the world record in dams. Um, more than 200, uh, sorry, 1,200 dams in my country, and large dams. We've got perhaps 3 million hectares under irrigation and thousands of thousands because they are under <laughs> behind the law, underneath the law of hidden or uh, illegal uses. But, uh, we've got a uh, some types of control, main the bureaucratic ones, the register, uh, the public register inscription of water rights, and so on. Other technical, we've got, I don't know the word in English, called delimiters, uh, something, water meters, uh, instruments, plates in the in canals, in the uh, dams, uh, in the pipes, and so on. And um, we've got also uh, satellite images to control what it uses. But the problem in Spain is water law enforcement. Water law. In, in the South Feet, I can't remember well, the, there is um, perhaps it's estimated that around 100, more than 100,000 hectares are illegal in the Southeast, in the province of Murcia, which is unbearable. And there is a water market of illegal uses of water. This is a very a market with thousands of kilometers of five tiny pipes around all the valleys and mountains and 
uh, around all the region in Murcia and uh, near um, the city of Valencia in the southeast of Spain, which is very difficult to control. And the problem is that the other main policy, perhaps the main policy under the EU legal system is the common agricultural policy foster all these illegal uses because they give money. And besides, local authorities do not want to control water use, even personally, opposing to the closure uh, of uh, against shutting down of wells, for example, in the Doriana National Park nowadays. And before the civil guard, the police, even before the public force. And that system of control were uh, obliged under the fishing acts dated back to the beginning of the 20th century, but uh, they are scarcely enforced today, even today. They were given a 10 year period uh, time to, to abide by the law, but it's quite difficult to find uh, general the general requirements fulfilled by water users. We've got uh, an in, indirect uh, means to control water. For example, in hydropower, we sometimes go to the, it's called the, the, the National Energy Commissions, just to control which hydropower plant, plants are using water. And we with, with mathematical, mathematical, um, Problems and, uh, and clues just to um, to get uh, all the consumption of water in hydro power plants because we can it, translate the energy production into water use. Uh, <clears throat> Thank you. If I may ask another question in relation to this, this is a very interesting point for us. And uh, Professor Brufau, if you can say, you also discussed the problem with uh, agriculture and uh, farmers. Uh, uh, is it fair to say that the problems uh, that you have uh, arise from the fact that there is no strong cooperation between the water sector and the agricultural sector, and that uh, the, uh, the inspection is not efficient, and that, that the penalty or sanctions have not been applied consistently in Spain in such cases. Thank you. Well, it's sometimes very difficult, almost impossible to, to enforce the law in relation to agricultural uses in my country. As you could see in one of the slides I have shown before, uh, in the Doniana National Park, perhaps the, uh, the most protected area in my country, um, in Andalusia in the south, which is a huge wetland, uh, perhaps there are within the park a thousand illegal wells within the park and another 1,000 wells around the park just to grow berries and other agricultural products, greenhouses products. And, and we have, after a 10 year campaign, including the national prosecutor, just closed 77 of those 1,000 wells. 77 out of 1,000 is a very small exit, success story. And no. sometimes it's quite difficult. No. Yes, thank you very much for your explanation. Uh, following questions uh, are related to Croatia. We will skip them now, as I already explained. We will have answers uh, in the forthcoming period. We have uh, one, several questions for both Spain and Sweden. They're written in English. Spain and Sweden, before a voter permit is issued, and how long the public review lasts? Mr. Robert, you first, if you want. 
Sure. Um, so, so again, we're talking. If we're talking about new permits, there there are uh, quite um, clear uh, rules about uh, contacting possibly uh, affected uh, people, and there's a process legislated that has you know that that, that, that a, a, a permit seeker has to has to go through. Um, so I don't know exactly the, the, the time, but it's, you know, it's, it, there's different steps you have to publish, you have to make it public and, you know, invite different actors. And then you have uh, on, on, the, on the regional level, uh, you have to, uh, you know, inform the, the state representatives and they also have a responsibility. So, so again, I think in, in when we're talking about new permits, um, the, the process is pretty good, and, and there's not many new permits granted in Sweden. Uh, so I think again, for Sweden, we'll, we'll see in the future with climate change if we're going to start thinking about irrigation. Uh, but for now, the, the big issue is it's not really new permits; it's the ones we already have, which is the biggest ones. Because for new permits, it's you know the process is good and and for many of these these issues when it comes to i saw for example this one from ombudsman uh present so, so sweden is actually one of the countries pushing the eu for for transparency and good processes and you know for, for different stakeholders to be able to to uh, to intervene in these public decisions and so on uh, and ombudsman is actually a Swedish word, <laughs> which is this kind of independent uh, overseer that you can complain to if things are not being done the way they should be by 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 government. So Pedro, I hand it to you. Yes. Well, this is the main problem. What's a law today in Spain? How long? <laughs> Apparently, it could be no? <laughs> for how long? Well, we've got. The, because it is a transitory regime, we've, we've got both regimes, the old one and the new one. The old ones date back to the Roman law, to canonic law, the church law, uh, for permanent, for good permits, for good. There are, there were permits given by the monarchy to water holders, to owners of land. Then that for good permit, Eternal permit was reduced to a 99 year period of time under the 19th century or, uh, Water Act. Under this, uh, it was issued with the policy in 1879 Water Act of Spain. The were issued, were published perhaps now 80% of the current water permits which allow water holders to use the water up to 99 at, uh, uh, for a period of uh, 99 years that were reduced up to 75 in 1985. The problem is when, since when? Since 1985 of since the water you was already taken, perhaps, 100 years ago. The Supreme Court, uh, a couple of years ago, declared that we have to count down all these years that remain in, in the hands of the water permits holders from the first day the water would call entering to exploitation. So the result is that perhaps 99% of current hydropower uses uh, which date back to the beginning of the 20th century, now they are, they have expired. The problem is that water bodies have to declare uh, all those water rights expires. And in relation to that, we've got another result. The first solution given by the water act is demolition. And we've got now this problem. We've got another problem. Uh, the central part of Spain is a more empty of people. We've got thousands of thousands of water mills, of paper mills, 
of little irrigated land, of orchards or were abandoned because there is nobody to take after those places. So we've got another problem. Water uses that in the register are enforced, but they are already abandoned because the main concentration of population in Spain is around Madrid, the capital, and along the seashore. And the rest is almost empty. So we've got now a maximum of a 75 year period of water use in general. And now the practice, the, the practice in water bodies is not to give more than 40 years, 50 years to hydropower or to irrigation. There's a limit up to 75 years. And the fact is now we've got hundreds of little small dams, hydropower dams abandoned in Spain. And also because of the um, not so profitable than before uh, regime of um, tax and subsidies incentive to produce hydropower. They are abandoned. And now we have around, I've got the data here. We have demolished, we have got demolished around 300 small dams and three large dams in Spain. All of them had the power ones. Um, uh -huh. Answer your questions properly, I don't know. Da. So we have another question for Sweden and uh, Spain. I will again read it in English. self initiate offer in the procedure of issuing concessions in Spain and Sweden. And is there a legal mechanism to regulate the number of self-initiated offers deplete a certain natural resource such a river for example sorry i haven't understood the question very well yeah, could you explain what self-initiated offer means Ja bih se molila gospodu koja su postavila pitanje da... Mogu ja da pojasnim? I will ask the authors of this question to, to explain it. Uh, this is when what some party wants to exploit some uh, public good uh, without a public call for uh, giving concession, they can initiate the process on their own. I believe that was the the meaning of the question. That's what we call here self-initiated offer. Perhaps Peter, you first. Okay. So I think in, in Sweden, uh, since it's, I mean, I think this is that we go back to the difference of, of water being a public good or a private uh, good. And in Sweden, it's, it, it's tends mm -hmm. more towards being a private good. So, I mean, if, if, we, if we're seeing then, you know, if you would want to self-initiate it, you know, do something with the water, well, you would start the process of, of contacting the, 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 the this is what, what's regulated in the environmental code. And you would say, well, okay, if, if we're talking about hydropower stations saying, oh, I have this river uh, in my land, and I think it would be great to build a hydropower station here. Uh, and then, you know, they would uh, contact the, the local uh, authority, well, uh, the regional authority, which have, have the responsibility for that. And you would start the process of informing all the people that would be affected by it. And they would have the chance to meet and you would have to have, uh, you know, this, this collaboration formally. You would have to send out invitations. You would have to show that you have informed and uh, and allowed these other stakeholders to have 
you know, to, to voice their view. And then that, that person that would want to have the permit would then go to the court of law, uh, to this environment, land and environmental court of law, and they would you know, present to the court and say, this is such a great idea, uh, I want to do this. And then you would have both uh, public uh, actors, uh, you have uh, public actors that have the role of defending the, the common, like the public interest, including environmental interest, as well as these regional bodies uh, that could, you know, act uh, and, and be presented in this court of law and that could question if they think it's not a good choice. And you would also, I mean, and this is in line with the Orders Convention, you would also have, for example, NGOs to have the possibility uh, to, to, to raise their voice and they have standing in the court of law as well. And then in the end, you would have a decision from the court and that decision could be um, peanut or you know when you take it one higher up to the superior court of law of environment and then you could possibly if there's principal important issues you could take it up to the supreme court of sweden um, but that would take a long while uh, so that's how it would go in sweden well in spain uh, to be given a water permit is up to the one who is asking for it. So, and they forgot also to present an environmental impact assessment and an urban planning permit and a, we call industrial activity use of that permit or agricultural permit, and then ask for it at the water body. And sometimes, especially since the and since the entry into force of the habitat directive, some of these water permits have been uh, rejected. And they have also uh, gone to, up to, even up to the Supreme Court, just to appeal that administrative decision and uh, rejecting the, the water permit, especially because of environmental law problems. And perhaps I recall now one of those cases near the Pyrenees, near the French border, a very huge, large dam for incredibly subsidized agricultural products by the common agricultural policy uh, was rejected by the Supreme Court because of the damages uh, probably uh, caused to the, to the river, uh, to the some, some species, especially protected by the uh, habitat directive. But it's quite problematic. And the environmental impacts, the positive environmental impact assessment it was issued in 1999. We've got a 22-year uh, fight before the course just, uh, before getting just uh, the large time projects rejected. The problem is, is about all those dams already constructed or built or under construction, construction sorry. Now, the, uh, the Spanish course are very, reluctant, we say, um, not so friendly to stop a work, a public finance, a publicly financed work to stop it at the beginning. And the problem is what we do with them when the, perhaps the, the project is being declared illegal, but the dam has been already built. Are we going to get it demolished? Not yet. Yes, yes. Sorry, also, Pedro, you, you reminded me the environmental impact assessment is in Sweden also, of course, part of the, the, the required uh, fulfillment uh, and also presented to the court in the decision. Thank you very much for your responses. The next question is related to the public interest in uh, water abstraction what is the bottom limit when uh, the public interest comes into play based in other words based on what indicators uh, a decision is made that the the water is the use of water is in public interest if the uh, concessionaire is not a public body and that's that question goes to Wh whoever <laughs> might be Peter. Well, this, if you allow me to answer now. 
Yes, of one, course. The issue of public interest. For example, the public interest of getting a golf course built in a urban resort along the seashore or mm, to give those water rights for agricultural purposes. The economic result, the economic asset or the result of the investment in touristic uses or to agricultural uses. Perhaps those are right, but in, because we've got under the water as um, an scale, a scale of water uses. The first is uh, urban uses to drink and for sanitation uses, urban uses in general, and then agricultural, industrial, uh, touristic, uh, energy, or whatever. Eh? So perhaps it's much more profitable to have a, a very green, under the sun, green golf course in Spain, which is much more profitable in economic terms than to have it for, I don't know, to, to water sugar beet, which is a highly uh, subsidized agricultural product in my country. And besides, some of the sugar uh, factories have, clo uh, have cost closed down in recent years. That is the main issue, which is the best public interest use uh, facing some alternatives. And we got another view of public interest, for example, environmental public interest to oppose uh, a large dam project be constructing in my country. Uh, that is now a problem resolved under the, the general administrative law in Spain because our environmental or citizens, citizen association have the right to appeal those projects for all the all the leads of uses in, in my country. You don't need to have any agriculture or property or industrial right or interest to to appeal those decisions. There is a general common uh, access to justice because of the Aarhus Convention, which is um, the um, uh, which the both the European Union and Spain are part of this international convention. And we've got another clue, perhaps, because they are not so profitable or ruin, complete ruin uh, in economic terms. Uh, perhaps if we just reduce the what the subsidies in agricultural policy, perhaps at 25 percent, I can recall now like an economic study of the Bank of Spain, perhaps we have uh, we could have uh, not uh, abandon perhaps 2,000, 200,000 hectares in Spain, because they are not profitable unless you pay for it. For example, tobacco, sugar beet, corn, wheat in my country. That's the, the problem, which is more publicly interested in these issues. I think, I think that the main problems for agriculture, for water use in Spain of water habitats protection in Spain is the common agricultural policy. I can quickly quickly jump in also, and I think this is the the, the you know the million dollar question. You know, <laughs> what's the public interest, and how do we decide? And I think that comes back to this to my presentation that you know when we speak about what indicators, we're trying to make it scientific. And we're trying to say, you know, we're going to find this optimal solution and we're going to find this best solution where we've, we've, you know, we've weighted all these things and we had a rational and objective decision. And I think we have to kind of accept that we're not going to find that uh, rational, perfect decision. What we're going to have is we're going to have lots of different interests. We're going to have a discourse. We're going to have conflict. And we're going to have, you know, in the background as as uh, Professor Burfau says, I mean, the EU has not figured this out. Uh, we have contradictory subsidizers going in from the cap, uh, which are not in line with the water framework directive objectives. And we have the renewable electricity directive that gives subsidies and say, you know, and it's really complicated. <laughs> you know, we're, we're not going to find this perfect solution saying this is the way to do it. These are the indicators. It's rather, you know, it's, it's quite of a, 
it's a messy process and you know we're in it and uh, and we're doing it right now i think um can you say something can you say something yeah yes, yeah. yes. we've got another motto now because uh, in industrial terms or economic terms because we had before a river uh, to make uh, industrial production or agricultural production and now with the river we produce biodiversity and this is the <laughs> a new sentence that is uh, uh, that has a great success nowadays in spain we've got rivers and aquifers to not to gain money but uh, to earn money but to gain biodiversity And now, for example, no company, no one, has entered into the general action given by the national government for new uh, hydropower permits in Spain. Not even a euro has been presented in that action held in December for new hydropower plants in my country, because they, they are not profitable anymore. Yeah. Thank you. The next, there are two more questions. I will read both of them. They are in English. And although the second one has already been discussed. The of the river bed and rivers the uh, expired concessions agreement. Are the long term plans in this context? in Sweden and Spain. And are there any long-term plans in this context in Sweden or Spain? And do not respect the water and environmental permit. Okay, so are the inspectors effective in Spain and Sweden compliance with these permits. In this context, are there complaints from public that inspectors are ineffective? Um, okay, so, so I think this question goes back to what, what we've heard from, you know, Alida also in, in, in Croatia. I think it's something for new, new EU countries and for all the EU countries to say. And it's this issue, you know, transposing, implementing and enforcing. And it's, you know, it's relatively easy to transpose, and then it gets harder to implement, and then it gets even harder to enforce what you're supposed to enforce. And I th in Sweden, it's relatively speaking, uh, you know, good rule of law and, and you know, people, people, uh, people uh, abide by the rulings and what's, what's you know, what's formally being decided. Um, and if we're talking about how successful the restoration efforts are when you've had when you have a removal of a hydropower dam, for example, I mean you have to have in mind that until now there hasn't been many removals because these permits were granted forever, so there was very very little done. What was done was done, but it was very very little because it was almost impossible to restore a river unless the hydropower producer agreed to it. And uh, you know that 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 is a hard hard thing to do. Many times, sometimes it, it could happen. We had some areas with really high environmental values and endemic species, and you know they, they did some, and they got lots of lots of public funding to do it as well. But it was very very small. What we're seeing now, which I think is 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 a realistic plan in Sweden, when they're saying, okay, we need to get, the, you know, we need to take out the the, the economic bits from the equation. You still have lots of emotional value and you have lots of people in Sweden that have had a hydropower dam and before that their parents had a mill where they were they were doing it. so so it, there's been this use of water for generations and of course the, the per, people that have done that have an emotional attachment to continued uh, using or, or doing uh, hydropower production but what you can remove is this economic incentives and that is one of the good things i think in Sweden where they actually said Okay, uh, you can get 90% of your losses will be covered by this fund. So when you go to an individual and say you have to have modern environmental provisions, so you have to have a fish passage, you have to have this, and it's going to cost you 100,000 euros. 
Well, they get 90,000 back from, uh, from uh, you know, or if it's 10,000 euros, they get 9,000 back, more or less, from this fund. And once the decision is taken, it will be implemented. Uh, and uh, and uh, the question is, is getting there. And I think also this, this kind of relates a bit to what we see again, and I, I saw it in Croatia and also Spain, it's this old and new laws that are conflicting and that are not you know, working very good. And that is what this plan in Sweden is doing. It's taking, we've had all these old laws from 1918, and now they're saying, okay, well, we have to, in a sense, start new, and we have to review all the ones we have, and we have to apply you know, the EU legislation and new environmental legislation to all of them. So they're going through every permit for hydropower produced production in Sweden during the next 20 years. So in a sense, you know, starting from not a blank page, but saying, okay, everything we had before, well, we even, we have to do this revision. Okay, yeah, I think that scientists say that revenue restoration is sometimes quite easy to get because rivers and wetlands are very dynamic. So um, uh, getting rid of the problem, a dam, a uh, diversion of water or whatever, the, a river, a wetland can recover very quickly. And said that we've, we don't have a long-term plan for river restoration in Spain. We've got um, in the specific basic hydrological plans some clues, some projects, some even aspirations to get done in relation to river uh, restoration. For example, there is a national, but very poorly funded, uh, a national restoration river of rivers in Spain that sometimes have uh, a great success. For example, in other rivers, in the, in the cold degree in Spain, um, uh, from the French border to Portugal, uh, we have mm, got demolished around 200 dams of those 300 dams demolished in Spain nowadays. So, and the river, uh, they recover very quickly and very easily, not only for environmental purposes, for also for uh, security purposes and uh, to avoid flood uh, damages, uh, for example, because the, the small dams, uh, put up at the level of the rivers and they can put in rigs uh, towns and villages and cities and industrial areas and so on. Uh, about the second part of the question, what are the penalties for investors who do not respect the water environmental permit? 90% of the, of the cases they have um, have no result. Uh, if you can calculate, um, to make a calculation of the risk of being uh, fined, uh, of being punished by the law, perhaps you keep on uh, unfulfilling the law because it's much more profitable to, to unfulfill the law to, uh, than to buy, buy it. So sometimes there is no effective penalty for investors because it's quite difficult. The first of all, it's quite difficult uh, to control water use. And sometimes, and then perhaps is you check both in in the justice balance, and you balance the risks of uh, keep on uh, keep on being illegal, and the risk of econo with economic result of being legal, and perhaps uh, you can. Um, you can have a negative uh, result for the general society and to keep on um, unfulfilling the law. Uh, are the inspectors affecting in Spain? It's quite difficult. We've got problems, a lot of problems, just to get, or especially with hydropower dams, to get uh, with thermatic, with internet issues, uh, instruments and so on, to get all the water releases under control. But sometimes we lack staff. We lack, for example, in some provinces, there are only a couple, three or four uh, water river inspector or water rivers, uh, we call policemen, uh, police people, just to, to monitor or to control the compliance with these permits. It's quite difficult. It's quite difficult to first to control, then to, to file a fine against someone. 
then to get it um, appealed before the administrative body and then to the court and it's quite difficult. I wouldn't say ineffective, but it's very problematic to, to get them effective. Just to add to Pedro, there is a, 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 a publication where they look at specifically um, Doniana in Spain and Australia and another uh, and look at this kind of, you know, what's the risk, the penalties and what's, and it's, it, it, it's it, there are many steps <laughs> that have to be going. I could share that with Selma and it can be available in general also. Yes, we've got plenty of reports uh, claiming that the water law regime is not respected in Spain, but who cares at the end? Of Hello, I'm Gospodo Velika. Thank you very much, gentlemen. We have already exceeded uh, the, our, our time allotted to this uh, web webinar. I, I would honestly thank our panelists because they opened uh, our eyes. They gave us a full insight in the situation in their country. We heard some negative examples and uh, we can come back to what we presented at the beginning when it comes to concession and the use of water, it is a rather complex and hot issue everywhere. And uh, it is not simple and there is no optimum solution for this. What we can say is that, the, the, is that the, we should be guided by principles and hope to achieve an optimum solution. We need to take into account the rule of law, EU regulations, and uh, the applicable legislation at the national level. As we could see in many countries, in Sweden, Croatia, and Spain, there are multiple problems uh, related to concessions. And it was very useful to hear this very specific uh, examples. Uh, I thank you once again to the panelists and I hope the participants also obtain interesting information. I would uh, close with the comment which I like and with which I agree that it was very interesting that Professor Pedro said that after the concession expires, it is possible to demolish the dam and restore the river. We can hardly imagine this and uh, we discussed this and uh, Professor Pedro reiterated this possibility on several occasions. Every question that was uh, asked uh, in relation to our country or Croatia uh, will be answered. Uh, and uh, I believe uh, my colleague Seattle already answered some questions in writing. This uh, will be the end of our webinar. And I hope this was very useful for us, uh, for all of you. And uh, I thank once again to our panelists for the effort they have made to explain the situation in their respective countries. Thank you very much and goodbye. You're Thank you, it's been a pleasure. You're welcome, pleasure too.